Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, every so often we make a commitment, and then when the day rolls around, we realize, yeah, we really don't want to do this. And so we come up with some kind of excuse to sort of get out. I mean, it's just human nature, right? It happens all the time. Uh, but instead of using the same old tired excuses that you tend to pull from your well of uh, history, I'm going to give you some new opportunities that you can use. In fact, there was a Reader's Digest article that had 61 real-life excuses that people have used to get out of work. I culled through all 61, because I'm that kind of guy, and uh, brought what I thought are my top 10. So uh, you may want to, uh, they're not on the app, so you're going to have to write these down if you think you want to use them. You ready? Here we go, my 10 favorites. An employee said, I had to mow the lawn to avoid a lawsuit from the Homeowners Association. Because you know how serious the HOAs uh, can get, right? Uh, an employee's false teeth flew out the window while driving down the highway. I don't know if they were just too embarrassed to come into work without their teeth or if they had to go back and retrace, you know, the miles and try to find their pearly whites somewhere on the side of the road. Uh, an employee was blocked by police raiding her home. So many questions uh, are raised with this one, right? <laughs> I mean, she didn't say, I'm in jail because the police raided our home, so. Uh, or an employee got stuck in the blood pressure machine at the grocery store and couldn't get out. This just goes to show high blood pressure can really limit what you're able to do in life, so please take care of your blood pressure. Uh, an employee's wife found out that he was cheating on her, and he had to spend the day retrieving his belongings from the dumpster. Hey, but at least he still had his teeth, so there is that, right? Uh, an employee called in sick because he accidentally ate cat food instead of tuna and was deathly ill. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure if cat food's going to make you deathly ill. Uh, I'm guessing that the cat probably threw all of his clothing out into the dumpster after that incident, uh, besmirching the cat food. An employee said he couldn't come to work because a fortune teller had asked him not to step out of the house or he would suffer a brain hemorrhage. Because you can't argue with science, right? Uh, a male employee claimed he had morning sickness. I'm guessing it was in the morning when he called in. Uh, Should have Googled that one ahead of time, though, probably. Now, just all these have been pretty lame, right? These excuses. And these were the best of the 61, right? Uh, but the last two have a special place in my heart uh, because of the honesty of their excuse and what it says about who they are as individuals. You ready? Here we go. An employee was bowling the game of his life and just couldn't make it into work. You know, those, those elite frames come only once so often, so you got you to roll with it. Uh, or an employee woke up in a good mood, didn't want to ruin it. <laughs> We've all been there, right? You know, it's, it's just too good of a mood to go to work today. So, wow, welcome to the third week in our Lenten sermon series entitled Eating with Jesus, and we've been journeying along the way through uh, Lent up to Holy Week, and we'll eventually get to Easter with Christ. And we've discovered in this journey that Jesus likes to eat. In fact, he's on his path to Jerusalem, and in this series, two helpful insights that seem to be recurring over and over again, and I want to uh, bring them to our attention as well. First, Jesus will eat with anyone who invites him, right? He is not picky. He will accept invitations from anyone that opens their home uh, to him to come in and sit. Now, secondly, religious leaders are often not happy with the people that Jesus chooses to eat with uh, along the way. Amongst other things, they're not happy with Jesus about. Our gospel reading for today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 14. Now, at the beginning of the chapter, we're not going to get into this, but if you want to read it later today, it'll be helpful to kind of set the stage. Uh, Jesus is invited to the home of a Pharisee, a, a religious leader of that time, and he accepts and it's the Sabbath, and he's had some run-ins with the religious leaders on the Sabbath before, so they're watching him very closely to make sure he doesn't do anything that would break the law of Moses. And sure enough, a man comes in with a very serious skin condition, and Jesus heals him on the Sabbath. 
So that gets the Pharisees dander up, and they start questioning about his right to heal on the Sabbath. Jesus responds with a parable about the seating at banquets, and he gives some advice to his host about a future guest list if you want to be more in line with the kingdom of God. And he finishes with these words, verses 13 and 14. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Evidently, this mention of the word resurrection prompts one of the dinner guests uh, of the Pharisees to, to speak up and give a beatitude of his own. Verse 15. One of the dinner guests, upon hearing this, said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, what he's referring to, of course, is the great banquet that will take place at the end of time when God's kingdom will come to full fruition. We've been talking about that for the last few weeks or so off and on. Kenneth Bailey has a wonderful summation of the great banquet in Israel's history. In Isaiah chapter 25, the prophet dreams of this moment in time when people from all nations will come and gather at God's table and there'll be food aplenty for everyone, death will be no more, tears will be wiped away. Isaiah says it will be a glorious day of salvation. Well, in the 6th century BC, many Jews were taken into captivity in Babylon. And about 70 years later, some of them and their descendants came back to Israel. But by this time, because one of the policies of the Assyrians when they take over a new area is to take some of the people away and bring in people from other cultures. So by the time half a century had, or more had passed, when the Israelites come back, um, uh, Hebrew is no longer the common language. In fact, Aramaic is. Aramaic was the language that Jesus grew up, grew up speaking as well. And so as time passes, synagogues were built, uh, scriptures were read in Hebrew, but the people didn't understand Hebrew like generations before did. So they then had to translate what was read into Aramaic. Well, Around the time of Jesus, a written Aramaic translation of the scriptures began to emerge. It's called the Targum. And it wasn't just a translation. It was sort of like a, a translation with some um, editorial comments thrown in as well. And uh, biblical scholars find that the Targum is very helpful in understanding how people in the first century understood the various Hebrew scriptures, because it had their commentary on kind of what they interpreted as. Now, what's interesting is how the Targum deals with Isaiah chapter 25, their great banquet, right? Well, they still have this great banquet, uh, and people from all nations are invited, but when they come, if they're from a nation other than Israel, they are uh, uh, afflicted with great plagues in, in Isaiah 25. About the same time, a second century BC document emerged called the Book of Enoch, it also speaks of the great banquet with the Messiah. It even includes Gentiles or non-Jews at the table. But in this account, the angel of death comes to smite all non-Jews. They don't even get to come to the table with the Messiah. You've probably heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. One of the books in the Dead Sea Scrolls is referred to as the Messianic Rule. And it also discusses the great banquet. However, it says no Gentiles, non-Jews, would be present at all. Only those pious Jews who observe the law will be permitted to the Messiah's table. There's even a part that says that no one, even if you are a Jew, you cannot attend if you're, quote, smitten in the flesh or paralyzed in feet or hands or lame or blind or deaf or dumb. So now, by Jesus' day... Isaiah's beautiful vision of Jews and Gentiles gathered together at God's table with the grand invitation to all, that's been reinterpreted three separate ways. The Targum, the Book of Enoch, the Messianic Rule. Back to verse 15. One of the dinner guests, upon hearing this, said, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Fred Craddock, a biblical commentator, says, apparently the man was not only enjoying the banquet uh, before him, but he felt confident that he had a reserved seat at the messianic banquet in God's kingdom. And so Jesus responds, verse 16. Then Jesus said to him, someone gave a great dinner and invited many. And at the time of the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Kenneth Bailey says that in a traditional Middle Eastern village, the host of a banquet, there would be a two-part invitation process. 
he or she would first send out the invitations. A servant would go and take them to the various guests and invite them to come and say when it was going to be. And then when they RSVP'd and sent back, then the host would know how many people are coming and would choose uh, what sort of meat and the quantity of which that he or she would prepare and provide for the, for the dinner. Then on the day of the banquet, animals or fowl would be butchered, the cooks would work, the feast would be prepared, the table would be ready, and then the master for the second part would send out his servant and say, okay, go back to those people that said they were coming and let them know, come now for the feast is prepared. And Bailey says, the words that you see right here in scripture, come now, everything's ready, they still use that today in the Middle East. But this is where things start taking a turn. He said, imagine a modern day equivalent would be that if we invited people over to our house for dinner, right? We'd probably just maybe call them, text them, email them, and we'd say, it's going to be next Friday night, 7 o'clock, right? So then they would let us know if they can come. Friday night, our, people knock on our door, we open up and say, okay, we're just getting ready, come and sit down in the living room, I got some music on, there's a charcuterie board or whatever it may be, and uh, I'll have the dinner just ready in just a moment. And then you finish tidying up, and then you set the table, and you come into the living room and say, all right, dinner is ready, let's go eat together. Well, what's about to happen in our parable would be the equivalent of someone saying, at that point, they're in the living room, you know, um, I really need to go and mow my lawn. Uh, we got some new lights out in the yard, and it's so cool right now, I didn't want to do it in the heat of the day. I'm sorry, I have to go. Another person says, oh, um, I have to feed my cat. I always get confused between tuna or cat food. I just have to be really clear. I'm thinking now I'm going to go home and do that, right? And the third one says, I have so many bills that I just haven't paid. I'm going to go and do that. And at that moment, the food's on the table getting cold, and they suddenly walk out of your living room and leave. That's what's about to happen here. Verse 18. But they all, like, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I, I bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to try them out. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I've just been married and therefore I cannot come. So in Jesus' parable, the, the guest had presumably RSVP'd ahead of time, said they were coming. The host knew that they were going to be there. But now after all the food has been cooked and prepared and everything is ready, one by one they start offering excuses. They send their regrets. Now, at first glance, they all appear legitimate, don't they, right? I mean, buying land, that's going to bring security to your family for generations. Having oxen, that's quite prestigious. That will financially help you with your crops, either planting or, or harvesting. It'll go much more quickly. And who can fault anyone getting married, right? That's the first step in establishing a household. And yet, as biblical scholar Richard Vinson puts it, and I quote him here, <clears throat> The excuses the guests offer are bogus. Biblical scholar, right there, right? <laughs> Kenneth Bailey says, you know, if one of the guests would back out, well, not a problem. I mean, you can still have the dinner with the other ones that were invited. But if there's collusion between the guests and all of them one by one at the last minute back out, oh, well, there's something deeper going on here. They're trying to uh, shut down the banquet that's been called. John Carroll calls it a conspiracy of last hour refusals to attend. And not only would it shut down the banquet, but it would bring extreme dishonor to the host. So let's look at each of these three excuses, shall we? The first said to him, I bought a piece of land and I must go and see it. Please accept my apologies. Kenneth Bailey says, if you're going to buy or sell land in the ancient Near East, it would take months, if not years, uh, in order to, to go through that whole process of doing so. He said, before a farmer buys a piece of cropland, he would, uh, or she would want to learn everything they could about it, right? Uh, the quality of the soil, how well it drains, whether uh, the, the land faces the winter sun. Because in, in Israel, if it doesn't face the winter sun, then it's, you're really not going to grow well uh, in, in that part of the year. 
He will examine the quality of the terraces if the land is terraced and how, how well has the, uh, the, what was the yield of the crops in the last few years. If it's terraced, he'll go and check the terraces and see if they're in good condition or if they need to be repaired. Are there any fruit trees on the property? If so, how old are the fruit trees and how well has their yield been? There's so many questions uh, and research that goes into buying land even before the person considers making an offer on the property. But in our parable, Jesus says, the guest buys the property first and then says, I think I'm going to go and see what I just bought, right? He said it'd be like here in the West, uh, someone going home from work, calling his, his or her wife to say, oh, I'm going to be late for supper because, you know, I just bought a house for us. I wired the money. I'm so excited to see what it looks like, right? Nobody would do that. Of course not. It's absurd. In the Middle East, if someone's invited to another person's house, one, if you accept that uh, invitation, then you're expected to attend. If something happened at the last minute, you had to back out of it, well, then you would have to offer a plausible excuse. None of those reader digest excuses that we saw earlier, right? Otherwise, it's going to be a, a public insult to the host. So he said it would be something like this. Kenneth Bailey said, he would have to have said, my dear friend, you know that I've been negotiating over this piece of property for some time now. But just an hour ago, I got word that the owner said we have to settle on the price today. Otherwise, he's going to sell it to someone else. I am so sorry. I know I was supposed to come to your banquet, but I cannot attend. I have to take care of this. Please, will you let me get out of this so I can do that? That type of excuse would be okay, and, and the, the, the banquet host would be disappointed, but of course, he or she would be, I, I totally understand. That's not what happened here, right? What happened here was nothing short of a public insult. I mean, it'd have been better if he would have said, I'm bowling the game of my life, and I only got three more, uh, uh, what do you call them, frames to go, right? I can't make it to your party. Second, another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my apologies. Second Gus says he's bought no less than five yoke of oxen. He has to go test them. Bailey says this is an even more of a flimsier excuse than the first one, right? One ox by itself is just an ox. But if you have a yoke of oxen, that's two that are hitched together, right, with that yoke, that, the wooden frame that kind of holds them so that they can pull and work together. Now, in the ancient Near East, uh, most people didn't even have one oxen, let alone... Uh, or one, one yoke of oxen, let alone five yokes. So first, he's very much in the higher economic echelon. Uh, but every farmer also knows that oxen are useless if they don't pull together. Right? They have to have the same strength and stamina and endurance. And so no farmer would bid on oxen unless he or she has already tested them to make sure that they would work well together. Obviously, the second guest wants to insult the nobleman as well. And then third, another says, I've just been married and therefore I cannot come. Bailey notes that this third person's excuse is unspeakably offensive. He says he's married a wife and he cannot come. He doesn't even ask to be excused. He's just like, I'm not coming. I'm married. I'm not coming, right? Bailey says in the ancient Near East, it's paramount that one speaks of one's wife in a, a dignified and respectful manner. But the expression that is used in Jesus' parable is the equivalent of saying, I've got a woman in the back of the house and I'm getting busy with her. Don't expect me at your banquet. I ain't coming. Like literally that's the way that the Hebrew or the, uh, uh, the Greek was translated in this story. The guest isn't at a wedding. He's not on his honeymoon. No, he's already married. He's just staying home and decided, no, I'm not going to come, right? Extremely rude and totally unacceptable. The 11th century renowned writer and priest Ibn al-Tayyib from the Eastern Orthodox Church comments on these three excuses by saying this. Here the master of the house became angry because he knew that the excuses were vain and the apologies were insults that demonstrated the hatred of the guests for the house owner. Verse 21. So the slave returned after hearing these uh, uh, regrets by all of the invited guests and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to a slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. 
Now, in the ancient Near East, as with other um, uh, cultures around the world, shame and honor is a crucial element in society. So when someone has been publicly humiliated, like uh, the, the, the master of this parable who had invited people to come and they all backed out on the last day, he or she has the right to avenge that insult. And, and retaliating with verbal insults would kind of be the bare minimum, you know, say, spout off some uh, choice words about what you think of those guests so that all the town hears. But beyond that, no one would have held it against the master to threaten some kind of action to punish uh, what the guests had done who sullied his honor. But our host doesn't do that in Jesus' parable. Instead, he reprocesses the anger and he turns it into grace. One of the commentators said, I love this, he now becomes a patron of the disenfranchised, or as we were writing on the walls, the invisible people in our community, right? So the master orders his servants to go into the streets and bring the poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Poor, maimed, blind, lame. Where have we heard that before? Oh, I remember now. That's exactly what the Dead Sea Scrolls book said were not going to be welcome at the marriage feast of the Lamb, at the Messianic banquet at the end of time. Evidently, Jesus did not prescribe to the version of Isaiah that the Targum, the Book of Enoch, and the Dead Sea Scrolls did. Verse 22. And the slave said, Sir, what you've ordered has been done, and there's still room. Then the master said to his slave, Go out into the roads and the lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste my dinner. So that second group... They jump at the chance. They come to the table. The servant says, hey, there's still, there's still more room. We can get this whole section in. Come on over, right? And the master says he wants to make sure that there's no empty spaces at his table. Compel them to come in if you have to. Now, I, I'm sure you can imagine how skeptical some people might be. Like, just you're going around your business. Someone comes up and asks you, hey, I've got this big feast that I want you to come. Can you come to it? It's right now. Right? And you're like, yeah, what's the catch, right? Uh, uh, depending on what generation you are, is this a candid camera, a punked, a, a impractical joker's bit that I'm not aware of, right? Especially if the person knows that they're no one of substance. Like, why would I be invited to this grand banquet? There's, there's got to be a mistake. That's why the master says the servant has to compel the people to come in. Again, from the 11th century, uh, Ibn al-Tayyib says this. Oblige them to come in. This doesn't mean compulsion or force or, or persecution, but refers to the strength of the need for urgent solicitation. Because those living outside the town see themselves as unworthy to enter the places of the rich and to eat banquets. Such outsiders need someone to confirm that there indeed is a welcome awaiting them there. Isn't that great? Sometimes people just need to know there's a welcome that's awaiting them. And how significant is it that the parable ends with, for I tell you, none of those who were invited shall taste my dinner. This is the proverbial no soup for you, right, from Seinfeld. That, except contrary to Seinfeld, it really isn't about being rejected, right? Don't do anything to anger the soup Nazi or you won't get it. No, that's not what's happening here. This is about choosing to reject the invitation that has been offered you. No one's getting excluded because the master doesn't like them or want them. They're being excluded because they didn't want to come. They turned down the invitation. And for Jesus, his life and ministry on earth, the, the messianic banquet was just starting to take place because the Messiah was walking among us. And religious leaders listening to the parables, they were invited to come to the banquet that Jesus was extending. But if they refuse to come, the banquet's still going to happen. Jesus is still going to invite others, including the poor, the blind, the crippled, the lame, uh, the common people, those who were outcasts. And then later, as the uh, New Testament developed and the Apostle Paul and disciples started uh, sharing the good news around the Mediterranean, soon non-Jews or Gentiles started coming as well. And even though the religious leaders rejected Jesus, they were not able to shut down his banquet because he kept the party going without them. Today we gathered around the communion table. Actually, consider children's time. We gathered around it twice, right? And we received the sacrament. Traditionally, uh, over the ages, it's been referred to as the Eucharist. Eucharist means celebrate. It's a celebration. And, and 
It's uh, partly the Eucharist is, uh, communion is a reminder, it's a foreshadowing of the great banquet that will all gather around the table of the Lord at one day at the end of all time, that everyone is invited to come and partake. It's a time to remember the past, those saints, as we are making our banquet list of those people that had an influence on our life. Some of those no longer with us, but uh, they help nurture us on our faith journeys. We also look forward now to the time when everyone will eat at the end of all time. And it's a table that reminds us that even though we as humans aren't always faithful and true to God or to one another, God takes the the messiness of our lives and transforms that anger into grace. That's really the gift of the cross, right? That even in the midst of rejection and misunderstanding who Jesus was, Jesus responded with grace, not with anger, not with uh, vindication or retaliation. Any judgment that, that, is, uh, uh, that may come is self-imposed. The parable tells us you have the opportunity to accept this invitation to come to the table. And if you choose not to, you're the one who's cutting yourself off. So the invitation has been given. Let us not make excuses to avoid being part of what God is already doing in the world and continues to do. The kingdom of God is all around us, friends. Let us keep the feast. Amen.